welcome. Um, I, I always feel like the million years go by between each Thursday when we meet. And it's like, I think, I think the whole pandemic has felt that way. Um, but I really look forward to these gatherings and I love seeing some new and familiar faces. And um, I just felt like when, when the pandemic happened in March, I just wanted to create some kind of space for us all to gather and talk about everything that was coming up for everyone. Um, so for those of you who are new here today, um, I've just been meeting once a week and bringing on some kind of amazing guest. We have one today and talking about grief and anxiety and just all the things that are coming up for all of us. I think that the pandemic has forced and asked all of us to think about big questions that maybe we weren't thinking about at the time or some of us have gone through some really big things in our lives and going through this new experience has brought up some of that stuff for us. So it's been so nice to gather here and hear what you guys are feeling, how you're thinking about everything and give you this chance to talk with me and our guests about it all. Um, today, I'm really excited to have Jason Rosenthal with us. He is the co-author with his daughter Paris of the New York Times number one best-selling book, Dear Boy. He is also a foundation board chair of the Amy Krauss Rosenthal Foundation, which supports both childhood literacy and research in early detection of ovarian cancer. Jason is also a public speaker, lawyer, and devoted father of three. He is the subject of an essay written by his wife, Amy Krauss Rosenthal, called You May Want to Marry My Husband. That piece is heartbreaking, brutally honest, and funny. It is a creative play on a personal ad for Jason in which a dying wife encourages her husband to go on and find happiness after her death. The column quickly went viral, reaching more than 5 million people worldwide. Jason is passionate about helping others find ways to fill their blank space as he continues to fill his own. Welcome, Jason. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, you're coming to us from Chicago, right? I am indeed, yes, yeah. Um, so I am really excited to talk with you today. I know that you have a new book that just came out. We're gonna talk about that, but we have to start, you know, how this whole thing started um, with this essay. I remember reading it a few years ago. Somebody forwarded it to me, of course. Um, how many of you guys have read this essay or heard about this essay when it happened? Yeah. Um, I mean, this thing went viral. I've always been a modern love reader, but this one just was passed around to a really magnificent extent. Um, tell us about that, about <laughs> how your life has changed since then and, and just kind of your story with it. Sure. You know, the, the number one question that I've been getting lately since I've been promoting my book is, did you know that that piece was being written? And um, I didn't know. Uh, what I did know is that uh, we were in the final days of home hospice. Uh, Amy had, uh, you know, terminal ovarian cancer diagnosis that we did everything we could to treat. And once we found out that the treatment was no longer available, we return, re, returned home to home hospice. And I knew that she had one final piece that she wanted to write, that, that I knew. Um, and I sat here like I have been during quarantine now, working as if it was my home office, you know, uh, watching Amy from across the room as she labored through this one final act. Uh, and I mean, she really did labor through, you know, she was on high doses of morphine and uh, in the final stages of her life, you know. Well, now, like, Amy was also a really prolific writer to begin with, because, I mean, if, if you're not familiar with Amy, then it would sound maybe insane to have someone in the last 10 days of their life hammering out a piece for the New York Times. But tell us a little bit about, back up just for a minute and tell us about her life as a writer. Yes, she was for sure. She was what I would call the umbrella is that she was a creative force, and that's really true. She made short films, she spoke publicly, but what she's best known for uh, is, like you said, being a writer. She's written s several adult nonfiction humor books. Um, but I would say she's most famous as a children's book author over a span of a couple of decades. Yeah, uh, she, she wrote 35 children's books. So it's an incredible, incredible clip that she wrote those books and, and published all those books too. Many of which were, you know, New York Times bestsellers, so yeah. But you're right, it was, it was incredible for, even for an amazing writer uh, to have come up with what she did in that physical state. That was really my main point. And so when I first read it, I was blown away that the piece was about me, that I was the subject of that, of the, of the final thing that she wanted to write. Um, and, and really blown away, as you, as you sort of alluded to, the prose was so beautiful. 
uh, it was just even even for a prolific author, it was unbelievable. And so she said, what do you think about me trying to get it published? And I said, of course, you have my blessing. Absolutely. Um, but being an accomplished writer yourself, you know that even with a ton of success, you never know what's going to happen with a piece. And I couldn't have predicted in a million years, uh, you know, the response that that article got once it was published. Yeah. Um, and so it was published 10 days after she died or she died 10 days after it was published? What happened there? Yes, it, was, it was 10 days before she died that it was, it was actually published, yes. And I can only imagine that you were not really thinking that much about that because you were in the last 10 days of her life. And I, I've, I've been a caregiver to um, my father who on hospice, so I know what those days are like. And so I, I can imagine you had some awareness of it, but you were also really present to what was going on in your home. Did you, when, I don't know, how did it all unfold for you, this essay? And yeah, no, I mean, it was unbelievable because it's, it's really sort of a microcosm of life. Um, you know, here's the highest tie for her in her writing career, really, in many ways. Uh, never had she had anything quite this public. Um, but here she was staring, literally staring down death 10 days later. Uh, but for me, you know, there was one experience I had, which is I went out to the Starbucks, you know, somewhere within those 10 days, and I saw my wife on the front page of the newspaper, and it brought a smile to my face, you know, but I... I couldn't really share that excitement, you know? Um, and I, and we, we tried to, you know, emphasize to Amy how popular this, is, this was getting. And she sort of had a little inkling, I would say, uh, mm -hmm. but wasn't able to really, really process it. And for me, uh, like you said, I was just way too down in the depths of my own grief to really appreciate the incredible, incredible response that I ultimately did get from millions of strangers, you know, all, all over the world reaching out to me. Yeah. What was um, your experience of loss and grief like outside of this, you know, this kind of public version of it? You had your own personal version of it as well. Um, had you been through loss before or grief? Yes, but not nothing like this, you know, and I don't think that um, in, in any way was I prepared for what was coming. Yeah. And what was grief like for you after Amy was gone? Yeah, I, I learned a lot. And what happened for me because of the situation being so public is that I had, on the one hand, uh, this sort of public experience of what we call in the Jewish tradition of Shiva. You know, I had a global Shiva in a way, as one writer put it. Um, but at the same time, it was very private. You know, I couldn't really process what was coming in literally in the form of letters and emails and people reaching out to me because I was so far down in the depths of my own loss and trying to support my three you know, young adult children. Mm -hmm. um, so I, you know, those first many months were just extraordinarily dark and sad and um, what I would call that tight, tight grip uh, of grief. Yeah. And it was, it was sort of, I, I was asked to give a, a TED talk and that was less than a year after Amy died. And it was through the process of writing that, um, that I began to get really into those, those people who reached out to me, reading the letters, appreciating the, the sentiments in them, uh, laughing a little bit at some of the funny things that I got in, in response to the creative play on the personal ad aspect of that article. Um, and, and that was very cathartic in writing that TED Talk. So um, now that you really kind of know the, you know, the, the deep throes of grief, what, what was it about that article that you think struck a chord with so many people? I mean, it was all, it, obviously it was so sweet and, and this kind of um, testimony to love and marriage and relationships, but also, you know, grief and loss, something that is unavoidable and inescapable for all of us. Um, what, did, what did you find in the responses? Oh, well, well two, two different things. I think in the responses, it was incredible for me because, you know, I, I'm sure this is not only my experience, but I felt like, hey, no one's going to be able to relate to me. Here I am. I've lost my, my wife of 26 years, you know, mother of my three children. I thought we were gonna have the rest of our lives together and no one could possibly understand that, you know? Uh, but quickly as I began to, to share my own story, I realized that 
like you said, we all do have our own uh, story of loss. Uh, not the exact same version. There are many different versions which we can talk about a little bit. But that's what I that's what I began to really, really appreciate because the correspondence that I did receive enlightened me to that fact. Um, you know, people really reaching out to me, uh, supporting me and my family, but also wanting an outlet to share their own story of loss in some way, feeling like they were part of a community. And I think I think the article struck 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 such a chord uh, because of that fact in a way that it's such a relatable thing, you know, that we all do go through. Um, but yes, it was also that unbelievable ability to combine tragic loss and also being able to laugh in the next sentence. That's that's an incredible combination. Yeah. I. You know, I've lost, I lost both of my parents at an early age and my mother was my really big kind of traumatic loss. Um, and I can't imagine what it would have been like if I had received an outpouring of support and camaraderie and, you know, like other stories of loss and other stories of, of women who'd lost moms or just, I felt so alone and isolated in my loss. So I can, and I, and I think about all the people I know you know, I've been counseling people through grief for over a decade. And I think about people who've lost a child or, you know, people who have like you lost a spouse or a sibling, or if, if, if we all got that kind of outpouring of, of just support and not feeling so alone, what an incredible thing that would be. Um, what do you think needs to change about the grief world in that, in that vein? Like, what is it that we, that we need to be doing better with grief? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that, um, I sort of missed in, we can talk about my book later, but in, in, in touring around and, and meeting people is that between the time I gave that TED talk for the last three years or so, I've been out in the world speaking publicly about these issues. And I think to answer your question directly, it's been clear to me through that experience that it's important just to talk about your loss and to share your story. Um, because as difficult that, as that is, and as much as you feel like you're bringing the room down, I promise you that um, almost everybody in that room has a shared story of loss and it would make you even closer versus bringing the whole mood down. You know? So I, th I think sharing stories is really, really important. Absolutely. So what has it been like to write your story and share your story? So you wrote a, you, you wrote a whole book in response to this. You also wrote, you wrote your own modern love piece as well, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah. So tell us about those. Yeah, so um, and on Father's Day of the following year in, of 2018, I wrote a, my own modern love column in response to Amy's pretty much. And it was the same title as my book. And then I was approached by the publisher to see if I wanted to expand it into a book form. And, um, you know, it wasn't, the, like I said, it wasn't the first time that I began to write and think and speak about uh, these issues, but, um, it was a fascinating process for me because I almost treated it like I would have been writing a nonfiction article. You know, I went down into my basement and took out all of our old things, you know, stuff the kids wrote, uh, cards that we wrote back and forth to each other for anniversaries, lists, all kinds of different things that you just sort of put away and you think, when am I ever going to get back to these? And it really helped me sort of to piece together a lot of my own life, to be honest with you um and begin the writing process so you know i want i wanted people to know a little bit about those two people that were the central focus of the essay that went so very viral um and as it, as it turns out you know that first section of the book that i talk about relation my relationship and relationships in general um has really struck a chord with some people that's beautiful um, I think that, yeah, there's a lot that people can project onto that idea of that, of that essay, you know, and so for you to really dig into it and deepen it um, must have been very cathartic for you as well, just to really kind of pour through that and own your story. And I think that is such a thing that people need to do when they're grieving is share their stories, write about it, kind of go through that life review. Um, I think it's a really important part of the grieving process. Yes. How long did it take you to write the book? Well, I had a tight window. I, they asked me to write this book in six months, which doesn't sound like a lot of time, but it, it was pretty fast. Yeah, it was a quick turnaround, uh, especially for someone who, I mean, I've never written anything 
specifically that long before, of course, and it was so very personal. Um, but yeah, I, I committed pretty much full time to doing that. And then, you know, through the ed editing process, et cetera, it was many months after that until it was done. But. Amazing. I was um, skimming through some articles about you this week and so much of the focus was, you know, did you find another woman? And I don't want to ask you that question, but I want to ask you about what has that felt like or been like for you? And what was it like with Amy? You know, I mean, how did that feel to you? And, and what is it like to have that focus? Um, well, there, yeah, I, with Amy in particular, you know, we spoke a lot about it. And of course, she gave me the ultimate gift. I think it's in my opinion, the people have asked me whether it was a, a gift or a curse, you know, I, I think it was the ultimate gift to really say publicly that it's okay that you know, you're a relatively young man, uh, relatively. And, um, you know, you may have some life here to live, and I want you to enjoy it. And you have my blessing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I do consider that a, a tremendous gift. And a couple things, I think, to answer your question. First of all, it's extraordinarily complex, you know, um, and it still remains complex. Uh, uh, but but getting back into the world of even feeling like you might want to date or be with someone else is, is very, very difficult to process, mostly emotionally, mostly inside your own head, because as I experienced by not only talking with my own adult children, but with my family and close friends, you know, people I think ultimately just want you to be happy, you know, um, but that's sort of easier said than done. You know, those first few little baby steps you take in that direction are, are hard. Um, and because I think that I was given that incredible gift, I chose to speak a little bit about my process in, at the end of my book um, to, to really just pay it forward and say to other people in my position that it's, it's hard, it's complicated, it's tricky, but it's okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about Nora McInerney. Um, do you know who she is? She does the podcast, Terrible Thanks for Asking, and um, the Hot Young Widows Club. But I, I think the start of one of her books or her podcast, she says, I'm in love with two men, you know, and one is her deceased husband and one is her now husband. And I think that there's this thing of holding space for both. You know, you can't just replace that space in your heart, you know, with somebody new. I think you just have to, it's like having multiple kids, you know, you just, your heart gets bigger because you have to be able to keep them all, right? Oh, it's so true, you know, and and it's certainly tricky to be with, with me because here I am even today speaking a little bit publicly about Amy and about my process and about grief. And um, so it takes a unique individual to, to want to be with me, but you're right, I mean, here in my heart is always going to be a little bit of Amy and, and anyone who's with me knows that. And it, it certainly, I think is, you know, as you suggest, normal and okay. I didn't choose to have this situation um, come up for me in my life. I, I, I wanted to be with Amy the rest of my life, you know, and so um, that wasn't, that wasn't in the cards, but she is with me and with my children always. One of the things that I see a lot of people go through, um, people that I work with, is when they lose a, a partner, how to how to hold space for their kids while grieving at the same time. Can you speak a little bit to that? Because I know that that is very difficult for a lot of people. It is very difficult. You're right, and it's it's really age dependent, and, and it's so different, you know. Um, but I think the common thread through whether you have young children or adult children, like I do. Uh, is the incredible resilience of kids. Um, and, and for me, I think the biggest thing that I learned is that, you know, I was the center of all this attention. And so I was grieving publicly, um, but I was also grieving within the confines of our family. At the same time, these incredible children were also grieving the loss of their mother. And I had to always keep that in perspective and and i've learned so much over the last three three plus years in talking with them and them really um reminding me of that fact in a way you know i lost my mom too you know you got to remember that and it's i i think those conversations are really really productive how old were they all roughly 22 four and six something like that okay how are they doing now Kids are wonderful. They're 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 really doing great. You know, um, two of them are in Manhattan. Back in Manhattan, they were quarantining with me for several months, which was an unexpected treat. It was really nice. 
and my oldest son lives in Los Angeles. So uh, they're doing well. They're doing well. That's good. Thank you for asking that. Yeah. So what do you have to say to someone who is kind of maybe either approaching going into this experience that you've had or, or in it already having lost somebody, um, a partner or someone very close to them? What, what, do you, what do you have to say about grief and how to move through it? Yeah, um, I mean, there's for sure stages of grief, whatever way you want to interpret that. Uh, my, my advice, though, would be to really, in the beginning, to, to dive deep into what feels like the worst moment ever, right? And to, to, to get into that place of really experiencing uh, the heavy, heavy grief, because that's okay. That's part of the process, you know? It means, I think you'll discover over time, at least I did, that you really had a love or an experience or a relationship that meant something to you. And that's why you're feeling so intensely, you know, sad and, and powerful about it. And then to not let go of grief, you know, it's going to probably be a situation where you take three steps forward and maybe one, two steps back for a long time. And maybe for the, for the rest of your life, you know, in different time gaps. But um, you have to also, I think, uh, someone told me this early on, way too early, I thought, but she said, Jason, you will find joy mm -hmm. again. You know, and I thought, I don't know who you've been talking to or what your experience is, but I'm not going to find joy again, you know. Um, but she was right. She was 100% right. And she had been through the exact same situation or similar situation. And that's really true. So when you, when you experience those little moments along the way, um, know that that's okay too. You know, if you find yourself smiling, whether it's a week or a month or six months later, that's okay. You know, yeah. that, that's part of the process. I think that goes back to that idea of the duality that you have maybe going into a new relationship of, um, you know, not wanting to find joy again, wanting to kind of stay in that grief or stay connected to that loss and that person or feeling that guilt for having moments where you're happy or laughing. You know, I've spoken to so many people who, will be in that, that first six months or 12 months of a loss and then they have a, a fun afternoon or they find themselves laughing and they catch themselves and they want to stop because they, they feel like they're not supposed to. And, and I always talk about this idea of two things can be true at once. You know, you can always be missing your person and honoring them and part of you is grieving and you can still live a rich and meaningful life, you know? No, oh, I love the way you said that. It's really, really true. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, someone who's not as lucky to be, you know, in, in your uh, orbit and, and, and to hear that from you uh, may just feel that naturally and not kind of understand what's going on. So it's really important to hear it, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I'm just always trying to talk about grief as much as possible because I think people just kind of get lost in it and aren't really sure what they're supposed to be feeling, how they're supposed to be feeling. There's also this, a lot of messages we get about how long we should be grieving. Mm -hmm. yeah. what, what, do you, what do you think about that? And what kind of messages have you received about how long you should be grieving? Some people want you to get over it fast. Some people want you to always be grieving. You know, it's tricky. Yeah, I mean, I still feel a little of that for sure. Even as I, you know, proceed forward in, uh, you know, a new relationship and things like that, it's, um, it's, it's, it's really, um, I think, ultimately projecting other people's judgment on you. And it's, it's really not something people spend a lot of time thinking about. Um, I, I, th there's just no question that you will travel through grief, like I said earlier, for maybe for the rest of your life. Um, and so I don't think there's any timetable. And I think that's helpful for people to hear because it's really true yes time will heal time will you know get us to those places you were just talking about of joy of you know whatever your passion was for me it was going to see live music and i you know find myself dancing or, or you know really singing out loud to at a concert and sort of going wow yeah i, I am experiencing some joy here and, mm -hmm. and those moments will come yeah absolutely um how has the pandemic been for you i I know a lot of people who've been through some big loss and when the pandemic happened, it, it brought up more anxiety and grief or, or kind of brought things back to the surface if they'd been through a kind of recent loss. What's that been like for you? Well, the pandemic, you know, has certainly highlighted a lot of the things that I've been thinking about for the last three years, you know, because again, this falls into the category of experiencing loss of, of, of any kind. And I think 
almost everyone in this country uh, ha has been experiencing loss, whether it's the loss of your normal routine or getting your paycheck every week or, you know, God forbid, knowing someone who's really, really sick or, or losing someone. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I have to say that from, from my perspective, and I don't know if you feel this way, but having the experience of getting, of being so far down into the depths of grief and really feeling like I had the ultimate loss, you know, and also having in my background this, this, this version of my life that was so happy and loving and beautiful um, that I've experienced so, so much. And I just still have not chosen to let this pandemic take over my life in the sense that I know that at some point there will be a return to some kind of normalcy, maybe not as quick as we all thought at the beginning. Um, but it, it really had my, my own personal experience has, has helped me through this, this period of time. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I found it helpful too. I think one of the things that I've seen and been trying to, to help with is giving people permission to be grieving right now, grieving all kinds of things. Like you said, you know, we're grieving the loss of jobs, we're grieving our kids, what's happening to all of them, you know, coming out of school or missing so many different things. We're grieving people who, you know, didn't get to have their weddings or we're also grieving just listening to the news and all the, the public um, numbers and thinking about people who can't be with their loved ones or have funerals and all of those kinds of things. And I, I think sometimes people think that grief has to be about a person, but we grieve on so many different levels. Well, hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And I've learned that from people a lot. And, you know, the, the pandemic is not, uh, you know, choosing who, who will experience grief, you know, whether you have uh, a small child at home and you have to be, you know, best friend, teacher, mother, uh, you know, constant companion, that's, that's a form of loss for both of you. Um, and, and then there's like, you know, my mother who's in great health and, but she's in her eighties, uh, and she's alone and can't really see her friends. And, you know, so that's been a real sense of loss as well. Um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would, I'm going to open it up to you guys soon. I'm going to ask Jason another question, but if you guys want to start putting any comments or questions in the chat box or just even write that you want to come on video and ask a question to Jason or me or anything you guys are thinking, we'd love to hear from you and kind of open up the whole discussion. Um, in the meantime, Jason, I wanted to ask you about if you have any thoughts about kind of gender differences with grief. Um, often we do hear many more women speaking out about grief and kind of talking about grief. And it's it's nice to hear a man's perspective on grief because I think that whether it's what, that we're raised in different ways or we get different messages through different genders, you know, I think that there's a lot of, we just see a lot more women grieving. What, what, what have you noticed in that realm? Uh, just that, exactly. You know, I think that, um, look, you know, we, us, us guys, we have those same emotions somewhere within us, right? Mm -hmm. But it's just not, been part of our orientation to speak about them and to express them. You know, when women get together, they first talk about how they feel and all of those things, you know, and that's, that's just, the, I don't think that's a sexist statement. It's just sort of true. Yeah. And, uh, uh, you know, men, especially men of my, my age group have learned to grow up playing sports and suck it up and all of those things. And, um, I, I have found that it is difficult for men to express their feelings. And so part of what I think I've accomplished in writing this book um, is to talk about how I feel a lot, which was, which was not easy for me in a public setting, and to give men permission to express those feelings that we know all know are, are deep within us. I love that. I think it's so, so important. Um, it's, I've always found it like startling to see or hear because we see so, so little of it. I remember seeing Joe Biden talk about his son at one point somewhere and get teary. And it was just kind of startling to see because we, we, we have so few representations of men being open and vulnerable with their feelings or, or grieving. Yes. Um, what do you think, what do you think we can do to better support male grief? Well, I mean, the first thing we can do is uh, do what we're doing right here today, and that is to to talk about it um, and to have some men, uh, frankly, who uh, are comfortable talking about it and expressing the fact that it doesn't make you weaker, it doesn't make you less of a person. Um, 
and that it feels really, really good to let some of your emotions, your feelings come out through talking about it. Yeah. I'm so grateful to you for writing your book and your experience, because I think in particular, it will help so many men, you know, they need more male stories to turn to. There are a lot of grief books out there, but so many of them are written by women. Um, and so they're very much a female experience of loss. Um, while, while it can be universal, um, I just think that it will be so nice for men to be able to read your book. Um, there's a few questions here in the chat. Sheila would love to know more about how to support children who've lost a parent. Yeah, I, again, my perspective is specific to my own, which is that my, my children were, you know, young adults. Um, but I think the biggest thing is that I've learned over the last few years is to listen, really, really listen uh, to what they need. Um, and I know that sounds a little bit simplistic and maybe as an expert, you can talk a little bit more about that. Um, but that's really, that's really been my experience to, and, and, and I guess I would add at the beginning to really be honest along the way uh, to share with them what is literally going on as you know that someone, you know, one of their parent is, is ill. Yeah, it's tough. It really is kind of age dependent, right? Um, yeah. I've seen, you know, when a, when a child loses a parent, when they're under the age of 10, they, they often aren't capable of grieving. You know, they're not developmentally capable. So they, they, they're not seeing it the same way that we do. We look at a child like a 10 year old who's lost a mom. And we think about all the things that the mom isn't going to be there for that this child is not going to have a mother there for. And they're not thinking about that. They're not projecting out to their college graduation or their marriage or whatever it is that we are thinking about. So often we put a lot on them. And so I think that when children are grieving, it's, it's really a long process. There are many different points at which they grieve, you know? So if a child loses a mom at 10, they will grieve in different ways as they hit developmental milestones. Um, and I think that that's a really important thing to remember. So to continue having those conversations, continue meeting them in their grief spaces. Um, but yeah, offering that, that just support and that space to talk about it is, is so important. Um, I lost my mom at 18 and I was kind of right on the cusp, you know, of becoming an adult, but not really. I was still very much a kid. And there have been other points that I have continued to grieve or understand the loss in different ways. And, um, you know, at becoming an adult, kind of wanting to know her all over again as an adult, you know, because I didn't know what it meant to be an adult at that time. Um, so there's, there's these many different points, but I think you're right in just really providing space for them to talk about it. Yeah vital. Yeah. Um, Rachel says, Jason, I want, you, I want you to know that Amy's children's books are so beloved within our home. She's incredible. The foundation you've created in Amy's memory is beautiful. What other ways, big and small, do you and your children continue to honor and remember Amy? And also tell us about your organization. I'm going to add that on there. <laughs> yeah, um, sure. Uh, it's a really good question because um, one, one, one of the things that I immediately knew I wanted to do is to commission a piece of public art here in the city of Chicago in Amy's honor because there were a couple of things. Number one, I felt in my heart that she was a, a, a Chicago icon, you know, and she really contributed so much to the city through her community gatherings and projects and all of those things that she did. And selfishly, uh, you know, I sort of wanted a place that I could return to, that my children could return to, um, and potentially, you know, my grand grandchildren could visit one day, where we could go and not necessarily have to have a, a good cry, but that would, that had happens, uh, but to have a picnic, to celebrate, to you know, uh, just spend some time uh, at that location thinking about Amy. So that's one of the things that we do. Uh, she's also sort of known to. Uh, have these community gatherings at Millennium Park here in Chicago, which was one of our favorite spots. And so returning there uh, periodically uh, to think about her too is, is really nice. So, you know, the thing about um, going through grief with someone who's somewhat of a public figure as Amy was, is that she sort of exists in perpetuity, you know, through her work. And so I will continue to, um, share people, share with people Amy's work uh, wherever I go. Yeah. 
And then the foundation, thanks for asking about that. The foundation, I started pretty much immediately after Amy died. And I put together what I think is a really, really nice, solid board of directors. And the mission is twofold. One is to support work in the area of early detection of ovarian cancer. And we've issued a grant in Amy's name to a physician who's working currently. And on the other side of the mission, it's in the child literacy space. And we've been really fortunate to donate tens of thousands of books to kids in need all over the country. Um, and we have a unique position having the um, relationships with a lot of Amy's publishers and now mine and Paris's work as well. That's amazing. I Just to touch back to talking about children and grief and just in general, I think it's so important to find ways to honor the people that we've lost. I think it's a really beautiful way of staying connected to them. Um, sometimes I see people get really stuck in their grief. They get stuck in guilt or they get stuck in anger or depression. And often it's a way of holding onto their person, right? It's like an unhealthy way of holding onto them. They, they feel like if they were to let go of some of those, those feelings that, that they're letting go of their person or their grief. So finding ways to hold onto their person and honor them is, is really beautiful. Whether, you know, you're creating an organization or you're um, creating a, a place, you know, where people can go and, and sit a bench or whatever it is, or just, or just doing rituals and things that that your person loved to do, I think are just such a nice way to hold on to them and remember them. Yeah, I agree. And you know, my unique position too, is that uh, I've been challenged by people even within my own family about whether I really want to keep speaking about Amy in this public, public way. Um, and I have, you know, literally all over the world. And, and to me, uh, the answer is that I, I enjoy it. it. It brings me back to her, of course, and helps to keep her memory alive. And I think it's in a healthy way. You know, I don't feel stuck by it at all. Yeah, no, I'm similar. I've been talking about my dead parents for 20 years now, you know, <laughs> and every once in a while, I'll, I'll read some criticism somewhere in a book review or online. And, you know, it's not really my way of trying to talk about my dead parents all the time it's it's it is partly a way to honor them you know to make sense and meaning of having to go through that kind of loss at that age but also i think that what i'm trying to do more than anything is to talk about grief and to help other people through it and it usually really helps to have a personal story that someone can relate to and understand you know so if i were just to go and talk about grief in a kind of bland way without this personal story attached i'm not sure anyone would really want to hear about it and I think yours is probably very similar too. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, I missed a question up here from Nancy that says, is there an organization that is for young widowers? Do you, I know of several things. Um, Go ahead. There, well, there's the Hot Young Widows Club that Nora McInerney runs. Um, there's Soaring Spirits. That's not necessarily for young people, but I'm, I'm sure they have some subsets. And then there's Modern Loss, and the, um, which is a really great website that kind of is geared towards younger people. And I'm sure that has some really good resources. What have you come across? For wi young widowers, I think was the question. And I am not really aware of any, to be honest with you. Um, I sort of created my own uh, grief group uh, in the sense that I started to read a lot you know, of, of uh, personal stories. And in my book, I do uh, provide a list of some of those uh, that were written by, uh, one in particular was written by Young Widower. And um, so there's some resources in there. Cool, yeah. Um, well, Lisa asks, did you go through grief counseling, either group or one-on-one? -on -one? So that kind of adds into it. Uh, that's a good question. And I, I don't make any judgment by providing this answer because I just feel like grief groups were not something I was attracted to. Um, I just wasn't maybe ready. I'm not really sure, but for sure I did start, you know, my own individual therapy, uh, which I can't emphasize enough how much that helps me. And I really highly, highly recommend it. Um, even if it's just a place, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable for a lot of people, I think who don't know about it or have experience with it. But I think, you know, e even just considering it as a place to talk with someone neutral, who's not in your family or not a friend and, maybe just go there and, and, and cry the whole time. It doesn't matter, you know. Um, but for me, it, it, it was really instrumental in emerging from those really tight, tight grips of, of grief and loss. Yeah, that's what I've been doing for a decade now is being the person on the other side of the couch. And um, yeah, it, I think it is such a, an 
an amazing thing to be able to go to and to do, you know, when you're grieving. And you're right, sometimes you just go in and you just cry and there's kind of, there's nothing to dig through. There's nothing to work through. You're just there to, to just to be immersed in it and in a kind of space that feels, you know, comfortable. Sometimes when you really let yourself break down when you're alone at home, it can feel so overwhelming. So being just in that kind of comforting space where you know that that person's gonna hold you steady through it um, can be really helpful. But I've also seen how grief uh, filters into so many different aspects of our lives, right? In you know, it um, filters into our marriages, our relationships, our parenting, our, our jobs and careers. So having someone neutral that you can talk to through that is really important. I also think that group counseling is wonderful. I think, but you know, I think you're right. I think it really depends on the person. I've had so many people who just, uh, they're not, they're not either not ready or it just doesn't resonate with them. They don't want to hear and hold other people's stories. I think that that is an aspect that can be really difficult. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes that's the really healing part for other people though. Yeah. Well, I agree. And, and I sort of, I guess in a way I consider, you know, through my work uh, that I've sort of been in this big, huge worldwide group, you know, with people sharing, sharing their, their stories with me and, and likewise I'm sharing my own, but it just was not in a formal setting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, Beth says, hi, Jason, I'm a children's librarian and I have joyfully shared Amy's books countless times. I lost my mom at the end of March and watched your TED talk shortly after. At one point, you shared your story of Amy dying at home and what the dying at home experience can mean. It was an incredibly difficult decision for me not to have my mom at home when she died because it was so complicated. But somehow your story affirmed that my choice was okay. Do you want to speak to this at all? Well, you know, uh, yeah, I, I gave a TED Talk in April of 2018, which was just a little over a year after Amy died. and. The reason that I chose to do it, first of all, um, just a little bit of the background was because, you know, after this essay came out that we've been talking about, I was descended upon by journalists and seeking, you know, to <laughs> literally know a few weeks after Amy died whether I was in a new relationship and things like that. And I, you know, that this did not appeal to me in any, any way. And so I didn't talk to anybody at that point. But I was able, through being asked to give the talk, to, uh, come up with a message that I thought was important and that, that would help other people. Um, and so what I chose to do for a large part of it was to speak very candidly uh, about what it is like to be with someone uh, at the end of their life that you love and what that, that process was literally like. Um, and so it, it was just the only way I knew how to tell the story. Uh, but it, as it turns out, it really resonated with so many people. And I'm talking about literally after those 14 minutes were up, I was descended upon by many, many people who were so grateful to me for speaking in such an open way about that process. Because many, many people have been through it. And again, it's just something that people, especially in our culture, are not that comfortable speaking about. There are um, so many different choices to make at the end of life. And I think that um, it can be overwhelming and, and some people never quite feel that they made the right decision. You know, sometimes it's hard to land on that. And I think, I think a lot of this falls on the medical community and changes that need to continue happening there and how we move it towards end of life and talk to people about end of life. Um, mm -hmm. I'm part of the Endwell organization. And you know that's the whole goal of that is to really kind of bring a lot of these issues to the forefront. I worked in hospice for a number of years when I first started as a counselor. And it was um, it was hard to watch families struggle with how to make those decisions and, and kind of seeming like they didn't always have all the information that they could have. And, and that's one of the most difficult parts. And I, I really hope that we continue to push for changes in that area. I know there's amazing people out in the field that are trying to do that right now. Yeah, I, I mean, for me, there certainly wasn't any guidebook, but you know, if you're interested in learning about some of the things that I did uh, for our family, just by instinct really is, you know, I, I write about it a lot in the book, so. Yeah. Um, Dara says, my friend just lost his wife to ovarian cancer and I'm wondering what were the most helpful ways that your friends showed up for you? That's a great question. It is a great question. And it's a tricky one because I don't think people really know how to deal with someone who's going through uh, a loss. It's, it's just, 
it's, it was clear to me, you know, people, many people just don't know what to say or what to do. And um, I do share some of my own experiences in the book, but basically I would say, you know, just to be there and literally express the fact that I, I really want to be there for you. And I don't know exactly what to say, but I'm thinking about you and I'm here, you know, that kind of a thing. You, I can't tell you how far something as simple as that goes, you know. Um, the worst thing I think that I experienced was someone who didn't say anything, like literally in your physical presence and cannot form a, a word or anything of comfort to you at that time. And so I really think that if you say anything, you're not going to say anything harmful. Um, and so just really being present in a simple way. Now, I, I had friends who did things like, you know, send me uh, uh, Grateful Dead lyrics about love because they knew that, you know, that uh, I love music. And that was, that was a simple and easy thing to do, it brought a smile to my face and reminded me that, those people, that that person was thinking about me. Um, and, you know, yeah, so those, those are a few things, I think. Yeah, one of the things I like to advise to you is to, I, I always feel like there's a lot of showing up in the first few months and then people kind of drop off, right? And it's often around that six months, nine months where you're really feeling some of the real depths of grief. And that's precisely when everyone has kind of disappeared or expected that you should be feeling better. So always continuing to check in a lot through that first year, even if it's like you said, just to say, I don't know what to say, but I'm here, you know? Um, That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, There's that flurry of stuff in the beginning, right? Where everyone's bringing you casseroles and they're around and then it just, it just dies off, you know, and you're, and you're alone. And that's sometimes when a lot of the real grief sets in because that busy period has ended. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what i'm curious if you and amy how many like did you have a lot of discussions um about you know her wishes going towards her death and i mean obviously her essay was one of like kind of some of that obvious an obvious one but um i recently sat down and wrote down all of my wishes you know if something were to happen to me this week i have a whole document of all kinds of things that are both practical like account passwords and what are all my credit cards and things like that, but also like, I want my daughter to have this thing and I want to be cremated and have my ashes scattered here and all those kinds of things. And I think it's something we really shy away from doing, especially when we're healthy and not having to think about it. Um, what was that approach like for you guys? Well, what I learned and what I've been trying to tell people um, for the last few years is basically exactly what you just said, um, which is to you know talk about these very tough issues when you're young and healthy and when you can. Uh, <laughs> The answer is that, you know, Amy and I did have time to talk. We really did. And it was, I, I'm so grateful for that opportunity. Um, a lot of people, I think that I've, I've, I've learned leave a lot of things uh, unspoken and, and, and confused and relationships and all those things. But no, Amy and I, Amy and I had a chance to really um, talk about some intimate things. And th those ranged from her giving me assurance that I would be okay as a single parent, which was so important to me. I was, that really caused me a lot of stress. And then practical things that we talked about, including, you know, what did she want to do uh, at her memorial service? Uh, you know, did she want to have music? Did she want to have a religious component? Are there people that she really wanted to have speak? Things like that, you know, and, and that was really helpful for us. And then we did talk about some practical things like some financial issues and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, I, th I think it is so important to begin to have conversations along the lines of some of those categories that you just said. Yeah, really. it's not easy to have those conversations. It's really not. And it's sometimes very painful or sad. But I think that what's harder is not having them. And then the person is gone and you're left trying to sort through or figure out all these things on their behalf. And it's that can often be more painful and difficult. Yes. Um, and I think most people just don't realize that until you go through it, you just don't know, you know, until you've had to close out a person's life, you don't quite realize what you're in store for. Yeah, it's true. There's a lot. It's true. Um, there are some more comments and I'm not sure questions, but definitely some comments here. I don't know if you have your chat open, you can see any of these. 
Jason, but a lot of thanks. And um, Rachel says, a few years after the death of my infant son, I have found my calling as an end of life doula and educator. Thank you for bringing to light planning and preparation for death as, the, as well as the honesty of how grief continues to change and evolve. Mm. Uh, and then Kelly has shared a beautiful text that she shares that she copied that she sends to, um, wait, she said, but I lost my mom. Here's a text that I copy pasted to a handful of work friends who reached out. She said, waves of sadness come and go. Sometimes I am strong and other times I'm covered in tears. Thanks for checking in with me. It is a touch to know what to say. It's tough to know what to say. And many people avoid saying anything at all for this reason. I really appreciate your reaching out. Mm -hmm. that. Yeah, that's a good one. So, I mean, sometimes it's hard for the person who's grieving to know how to handle their friends, you know, because sometimes your friends are coming and they're like, tell me what to do for you. And yeah, like, I, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Hey, give me a call. Let's go out. No, that's, that's not something that really works for someone who's grieving. Yeah. yeah. So, Jason, um, tell us what you're working on next and where we can find you and how we can stay in touch with you and support your books and organization and everything. Uh, well, you can find me in a couple places, Amy Krause Rosenthal Foundation.org and uh, Instagram. I'm kind of getting a little bit better at. Uh, I'm at Jason B. Rosenthal. And um, right now I'm still promoting the book. And so I'm just not sure what the future holds at this moment. Yeah. Do you have a copy there with you? Can you hold it up for us? I just so happen to have a copy. <laughs> awesome. Oh, what a nice cover. Thank you. Thank and you. And it's available this, 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 anywhere books are sold. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And if you support your local bookstores, that'd be great. But the, the cover art, thanks for pointing that out, uh, was done by the gentleman, Brian Ray, who does the Modern Love Column artwork. So. Oh, that's so yeah. great. I love that. That's really special. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. I think um, I'm so appreciative of the work you're doing to talk about grief and just to honor your story. And I just love this conversation. Oh, thank you very much for having me. It was a really nice conversation. Thank you. Nice. Um, thank you, Dara, for organizing everything. And thanks to all of you guys for being here today. Thank you, Dara. We will be back next week. I've got um, BJ Miller joining me on what, August 23rd, maybe? I can't remember. Oh, August 13th. August 13th, BJ Miller will be with us. Um, so that's exciting. And I hope to see all of you guys back here. Thank you, everybody. Dara, do you have anything to close out with? Um, no, I mean, just uh, huge gratitude to both of you for this enlightening conversation and space. Um, and uh, I put the link in for the 13th, but I'm not sure what our, we're, we're still figuring out for next week. So stay tuned for that one. And then um, I also just posted two upcoming events as part of our Art Responder series. Um, we have Adia Victoria, who's a blues singer, who's going to be hosting a memorial for our collective grief during this time. And then an amazing comedian the following week, um, Chris Garcia, who has participated in a lot of reimagined events, and he lost his dad um, to Alzheimer's. And um, he's hilarious and touching and all the things. So I highly recommend both of those too. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you again, Jason. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And you, if you want to come off your mute and say goodbye, it's <laughs> kind of nice to hear everybody's voices. Bye. 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 <laughs> Thanks so Bye. much, as Bye. usual. <laughs> Thank you, Sheila Merle, for coming. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thanks. Wonderful. Fantastic. Great. Thanks for being here. Yeah, uh, thanks. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Okay, have a good rest of your day. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.